be really pleased to be invited to our county seat to talk about our little hamlet on the east end of the county. We would encourage any and all to come to the annual festival, which is coming up the day before Mother's Day, May 11th. Things start at 10 o'clock. We love it when folks share stories, bring photos, which help us learn about the history of North River Mills. But there will be other things going on. Reenactors, Rob Wolford is our village smithy, even though we haven't found him a spreading chestnut tree yet. <laughs> the cabin folks will likely be playing their music on the porch. Hopefully there will be a collection of old tractors, maybe steam engines. Uh, there are hikes on Ice Mountain for those who come early. Anything else going on? Food. Food, yes. Church ladies, that's one thing that uh, uh, there is. A, everything find, else is free. If I can find a chair, I'll be king. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll have the uh, chair caning going on. Yes, uh, did, you, did you mention hay rides? And we have hayless rides uh, with some uh, historical interpretation that you're welcome to. They are country Ubers. Country. Country fine Uber. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay. And we already talked about the email address, sorry. Uh, you're welcome to take the business card. Additional corrections, questions after the presentation. How do you tell a story of a town? How do you capture the lives of the people who live there? We will try to share stories somewhat chronologically. Um, we have shamelessly plagiarized the work of our daughter. My theory is that if you give birth to the author, it's your work. Uh, she began researching North River Mills when she was in fourth grade. That made her nine years old. Uh, North River Mills is located between Cape and Bridge and Slainsville. It's eight miles from Cape and Bridge, four miles from Slainsville, on the Cold Stream Road at the base of Ice Mountain. Over the years, North River Mills has changed. What was once a booming town is now silent and still. The post office, which closed in 1972, had 100 mailboxes. When we married in 1976, there was a store with gas pumps and eight families. This town that had three grist mills, a store, a church, a strong house, and Fort Thomas Parker, and in a lime kiln, blacksmith shop, now it's deserted. George Washington surveyed North River Mills area and what was Frederick County, Virginia. He made mention of it in his diary during peacetime. He returned to spend at least two nights there as a soldier. The town was first called Parker's Gap, and this came from Fort Thomas Parker, located just west of town, which played a role in the French-Indian War named after its owner and builder, a land surveyor, Thomas Parker, the fort was built in the fall of 1754. Located between two large forts, Loudoun and Winchester, and Pearsall and Romney, and eight miles from Fort Edwards on the Great Wagon Road, it was used as a stopping place for the troops, convoys, and couriers. There is no record of troops being stationed there. Even Thomas Parker spent very little time there. Fort Thomas Parker, or the North River Stockade, was not a fort as usually understood, but a fortified home or blockhouse with rifle slits and few windows. It's believed that the stockade encircled the house. Uh, we have our North River Mills pilot with us, who I, I didn't give credit to uh, people that flew the plane, took the pictures, uh, I apologize. So if you have any questions about where the pictures came from, ask later. Um, but what do we have? It's just small enough, if you could read it. Yeah, uh, we'll be looking at the church later on, as the Snap Mill, um, Asa Hyatt's, oh, what do we have? I uh, can't read it myself. Williams Farm, yeah. Um, so where are we, sorry? Okay. The French and Indian War was also called the Seven Year War, beginning in 1756 and ending in 1763. Most of the war was fought in York, but a small portion took place in what is now the United States. 
Some of the fighting took place in what became Hampshire County, West Virginia. This war was the French and Indians fought together against the colonists. During the French and Indian War, Washington ordered hunting parties to search for Indians. Captain Richard Pierce, a former Indian trader, headed one of these parties. His party was made up of Cherokee Indians and militiamen. They marched to the North River until they came upon Fort Thomas Parker. Arriving at the fort, they found it to be surrounded by hostile Indians. Captain Pierce fired on the Indians and reclaimed the fort. The battle lasted about 30 minutes. The enemy commander, a French, Sieur Duville, uh, was killed and three warriors were wounded. Captain Pierce lost one man while two others were hurt. Sieur Duville's scalp was presented to Colonel Washington at <coughs> Winchester. Washington sent the scalp to Governor Dinwiddie with the written hope the governor would pay the bounty. The bounty was divided among Pierce's men. Another scalping may have occurred near the fort, or it might just be a different version of the same story. Captain Joshua Lewis and 18 men of the Virginia Regiment came upon a small band of Indians led by French officers. A skirmish followed in which a French officer was killed and two others wounded. The scalp was also sent to the governor and probably a bounty paid. William N. H. Ansel's Frontier Force described the event. Barry Boswick, the movie depicting the presentation of the scalp to Washington and Winchester. The Gibbons family was living near Fort Thomas Parker. When Sarah Gibbons was 13 years old, the Indians kidnapped her. Unlike the Jane McCraig uh, shown in the photo, uh, Sarah, uh, she was taken to an Indian village and was kept by the Indians for nine years. Sarah had a half-breed child. The child was named Abraham Gibbons. 1765 to 1767, Sarah lived with the Indian village to find her, I'm sorry, she left the village to find her natural parents. Her home place had been sold to Dr. James Craig, we'll talk more about him. Her father, James Gibbons, had died in 1760. Her mother had married Derek Covey. Mr. Covey was a member of Lewis's militia who had come to the rescue when the Indians had kidnapped Sarah. Sarah's brother, Jacob, was now living along the Opecan Creek near Winchester. Sarah gave up her son to Daniel Sowers as an indentured servant. In 1774, Sarah filed charges against Sowers for child abuse. The child was returned to her. Sarah married Cornelius Lister and lived three miles south of Winchester next to her brother's home. Thomas Parker later sold the land to Robert Pritchard. It was then sold to Reese Pritchard. Kenny Baker now owns the land, which believed to include the fort site. In 2016, the state legislature declared a section of Cold Stream Road in or near North River Mills as a historic trace, honoring Washington, Craig, Pritchard, and Croston. Dr. James Craig, um, mentioned earlier, was Washington's personal physician who attended him from Braddock's disastrous campaign in the French Indian War until Washington's death. On the east end of town, you can visit Craig Spring. He was an early landholder of the large tract in and around North River Mills. But George Washington prevailed on Craig to move to Alexandria to be closer to his patient. There we have um, the trace that we mentioned. Um, what have we talked about so far? Uh, yeah, we're going to. Here's Craig Springs as you're coming from Cape Bridge, kind of the center of town, uh, and then it extends kind of as you're starting up the hill to Ice Mountain. Okay. We're going to the northwest suburbs. Bull Croston has researched the North River Mills Revolutionary War ancestor, Gustavus Croston. Bull found that Gustavus fought in five major 
Revolutionary War battles, including Kings Mountain, Cowpen, Musgrove Mill, Ichwa Springs, and 96. He fought it with the Virginia Battalion under Nathan Green. In June, the siege of 1781, Croson was captured in South Carolina. He was likely taken to Charleston, South Carolina, and put on a prison ship and released after Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, October 1781. Gustavus walked to Richmond, Virginia in 1818 to collect his pension. His grave is at the west end of North River Mills on the north side of Cold Stream Road near the junction of Maple Run and North River. What do we have here? So, the Croston Farm is, is you, here's the Ice Mountain gated community if you drop over the hill. Coming back down towards Cape and Bridge, the bottom of the hill uh, is the gravesite of Gustavus Croson. And then we're moving back into the town here. Did anybody have any questions about any of the pictures I kind of went through? Fast? So where today is the Dr. Craig's? Where is Dr. Land? Craig buried? Like, where's the land that he owned? Is that the... Oh, gee, that Charlie, it was your farm, farm, part of our farm. farm. <coughs> he owned three pieces of property in that area. One was at the bend of the road on the east side of town where the spring is located. And he owned my farm, which is off the edge of that picture to the uh, yeah, and here. corner down there. Um, and he owned another piece near North River Mill. George Marshman encouraged all of his friends to buy western land as a good investment. So that's what Dr. Craig did. And you'll notice that it was then, we, we don't make a big point, but it was then on the Great Wagon Road from Winchester to the South Branch Valley. So they bought pieces on the important highway. Before there was around 50, the, the wagon road going right through North River Mills was the major road west. So when was the Route 50 then? 1830s. <laughs> and who was Captain Turnpike was built yeah. in 1830s. Who's the engineer? Cro um, Crozet. And McDonald, Angus McDonald, McDonald yes. who yes. owned the... Superintendent. Uh, married to Cornelia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Lived at Davis House. House. Yeah. Was an engineer with that. Steve? Yes. Where, where did the uh, the wagon road go? Did it go? I guess Charlie the, has been researching. Um, it, it's really fascinating. It took me driving from Winchester one time, little uh, back roads. So basically, it comes. Can you go back one? Sure. <coughs> comes from Cape and Bridge to North River Mills and basically the route that the current road comes off. And then it turns off, this is Kenny Baker's farm, a large uh, bottom land here. It runs along here Up and then the heads through the woods. <clears throat> and it comes out on Kedron Road. From Kedron Road, it makes its way to Barnes's Mill. And from Barnes's Mill, uh, it comes up over the hill where <coughs> Shaw or Shawan Run is today. Um, behind Barnes's Mill. And we know that because uh, Gautso Gertzema, the surveyor in uh, Martinsburg, and going through the old land grants, found that that run was originally named Old Wagon Road Run. And I'd like to see us get that name back sometime. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the 1930s, when the U.S. Geological Survey put names on the maps, <coughs> they took the names of the people who were there then. So our history has been lost, and we would like to get some of that back. But it, it then comes up over the hill somewhere near uh, Ebenezer Church. And from there, we're not exactly sure, but we believe it comes to the south and comes down behind or to the south of Romney, uh, perhaps down toward where uh, the White House is, Gene Williams' house. Uh, but we're not exactly sure at that point. Uh, we see it cross the river somewhere along that area and then go through um, Mechanicsburg Gap. The Mechanicsburg Gap it then goes over to Beaver Creek and on up to Humboldt. Were you the pilot? He was the pilot. <coughs> and photographer. Uh, 
Um, well, actually, that might have been Dave. Photographer, but the pilot doesn't take pictures. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Dave. Never take pictures. Actually, somebody else was flying that time, wasn't it? Because you actually took the pictures. Well, there were times I just be flying along. You just hold the picture. So we will return to the town, which was later known as North River Mills. Uh, any question about locations? No, we, whatever. That town's name was derived from the North River and the three mills that were a major part of the community. The town's main economy was based on three grist mills. Each mill was uniquely different uh, in style from the others. Uh, ironically, only one mill, the Snap Mill, was powered by the North River. Part of the, and I can't show you a picture because it's been gone for a long time. <laughs> uh, part of the river's current was diverted to the undershock wheel. Uh, undershock wheels, like you see here, are uh, known for their many long paddles like that of a river boat. The more paddles, the more power created. The wheels were built using the formula, the distance between the paddles was to be equal to the width of the paddles. For a while during the Civil War, James Slain, an ancestor of Kenny Baker, owned the mill. With 30% efficiency rate, the, uh, resembling a riverboat paddle wheel, it was the least efficient of the mills. But it didn't have to be efficient. It had the whole power of the river behind it, uh, unlike the overshock wheels we'll be looking at. So you see the uh, snap mill here again, Croston's grave is out this way, and this is back into the center of town, uh, Kenny Baker's farm, or it was also the Williams farm. Just after the Civil War, Mr. Snap became the owner of Snap Mill. Maud Pugh, author of Capen Valley, opens her book with a delightful description of walking through the village. In 1930, the snap mill was blown up to make room for the new red bed. The ruins can be found on the Slainsville end of town, just as you turn onto Hartman Lane, Zion Church Road. The foundation and the pool from the will turn are still visible. What was it blown up for? Making room for, they were uh, redoing the road bed. Uh, actually, moved the road bed some. Uh, so we're walking south, I think. Um, southeast to the center of town, we find a mill race from Hyatt's Run supplied uh, sufficient drop for an overshock wheel at the Miller Mill in the center of town. And that's what's left of it, the foundation. Uh, it's on the Slainsville side of the old end. Instead of paddles, it used buckets. The wheels ranged from 10 to 30 feet. The <coughs> number of buckets varied according to the size of the wheel. A 10-foot wheel needed about around 24 buckets, and a 40-foot wheel <coughs> needed over 100 buckets. With a 75% efficiency rate, this was the most efficient type of wheel. Hey. Um, yeah. Back to slides, is that, if you go, is, sure. that, is that one more? Is that the Miller Mill? Is that the Miller Mill? Yes. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Still standing. I want to talk to you. Cause, what, connection with? Still standing. Do you have a connection well, with the mill? Like that. Well, I, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, okay. I'm giving towards the ice mountain and I'm taking folks yeah. to it. And uh, I was just curious if that wasn't back in the Sure. Room, you know. We got it from. Uh, no, uh, Peggy Miller, Sloan Millers. But we did get a bunch of pictures from the guest room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're related to the guest My maiden name is Guess, yes. Yeah. John Guess. We're going to talk about him in the store. Thank you. I, I recognize you, but the mill has three stories. Oh, okay. Did you want me to leave it there? Right. Just a little easier to tell. 
Okay. There? There? There. Okay. Three stories. Uh, in 1930, the flood took the Miller family to refuge on the third story of the mill. The Miller mill fell down in a large snowstorm in 1936. The Miller built a shed on the remaining foundation that still remains there today. Uh, no mortar was used in the foundation. One of the grinding burr remind, remains with the mill site. Slow Miller family has the other stone. The Millers also ran an inn which is next to the mill. The inn consists of two log structures. Uh, each end of that structure is a log house. joined by a frame section. The original structure was built in 1790. Johnny B. Miller was commissioned as a postmaster for our uh, postal expert here. Uh, in 1840, the Millers had a walking wheel, a spinning wheel, uh, that you throw the wheel and you walk up and back to uh, keep the right tension. Uh, John and his wife Sally had a cave, what they called a cave, I would call a root cellar, it's still there, um, which has the year 1812, you probably can't make it out there, but it, on the stone is chiseled the initials of the mason and uh, the year 1812. There's a log smokehouse uh, just outside the kitchen, and I'm sure you will be impressed uh, that the outhouse made it into the National Historic Register. You said three of them, right? Three of them in, what, in North River Mills. So. <laughs> the third and last mill was a diesel turbine mill that was powered. It was the Shanholz mill and no water was needed. Uh, the poor concrete foundation can still be seen across from the old store near the center of town. Henry Shanholz operated this mill. The three mills were never running at the same time. There was a short period of time when the Shanholz mill and the Miller mill were operating together. No water needed? Uh, because it was diesel engine. Oh. Uh, it, I know that one. <laughs> yeah. Returning to the Civil War era, Carol was kind enough to share a story with us about Rebecca and Esther Etta Washington, who lived at Ridgedale, Carol's home. Uh, they were sent there by, uh, they were sent to North River Mills by their father, George William Washington, to travel on horseback to Winchester, actually. Uh, to deliver a message to Stonewall Jackson in May 1862. Uh, by the way, I, I like some of the old Winchester pictures. You all may know the Taylor Hotel. Um, it, so this is the walking mall. Uh, it's where, I can't remember his name. If you know the story of Jenny Wade killed in Gettysburg, her sweetheart dies in uh, in the Taylor Hotel when it was being used as a hospital. Uh, where are we, Terry? Uh, yeah, we we still have the story of the uh, the Washington girls. Uh, so he instructs them to travel over the neighboring farmland to avoid the main roads. The journey is about 50 miles, this is actually a quote, journey is about 50 miles, but it will be longer than that for you since you are not to venture on the highway till you get to North River Mills. There are pickets all about, and you must take no chances of meeting them. His neighbor Hiram Alcar, here it's spelled A-L-C-A-R, but uh, the common name here, A-L-K-I-R-E, is usually pronounced all car. Um, would let down the fences. We don't know whether the journalist who was taking the notes to put that... Heard it, huh? Yeah, if he just heard it. And yeah. 
Um, so the Millers would do the same, plus put them up for the night. They traveled over South Branch Mountain. Uh, this was printed in a, uh, a 1930 article for a railroad magazine. And we have map again. Anything else? Anybody have any questions? Locations? I, I the South Branch have. Mountain is. What is it? Two days ago. <coughs> this mountain? Mm -hmm. No, they went from here over to um, yeah. North River Mills, so they crossed over South Branch Mountain and in an article from a historic society in 19... 60 something or other, where they took a trip to uh, up to the top of. The mountain. They said it was called different. It was, it was a different name. It's a current name. Yeah. It was Jersey Mountain or what? Maybe it's Jersey Mountain. It's cool. Southridge Mountain. Yeah. Frederick Kump was a blacksmith whose log home still stands a fourth of a mile from Cold Stream Road. The land was part of a huge land grant once owned by Lord Fairfax, who sold the property to Mr. Bajet, who sold it to. Mr. Moreland, and Mr. Moreland built the front part of the house in 1802, or 1808. The house did not have a kitchen, and Frederick Cump's wife indicated, I think that's a very nice word, <laughs> that she wanted a kitchen. Frederick moved the blacksmith shop and hooked it to the house, thus having a kitchen. <laughs> there are 20 unmarked graves in the cemetery. Two of the unmarked graves belonged to Frederick Kump and his daughter, Hattie. William Kump was the son of Frederick Kump. According to the October 8, 1850 census, he was born in 1848. William decided to join the Union Army. His father was a Southern sympathizer. One story, story tells that the father, Frederick, followed William out of North River Mills, pleading with him. Uh, not to go, not to leave. Uh, you can imagine the father asking how William could fight against his own country, Virginia. Um, fight against his family, his friends. Uh, but William had apparently decided that his country was the United <coughs> States. So he continued to Paul Paul to enlist. February 23rd, 1864, to get into the army, William lied about his age. He apparently said he was 18 when he was actually two years younger. He was killed in action six months later in Halltown. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that over around Harper's Ferry. Um, we have um, a sketch of Halltown before the battle done by Port Crayon who is David Strother. Um, it's kind of interesting to me to know that David Strother came to Ice Mountain, North River Mills, in 1840, I think, as a tourist and sketched Raven Rock, the old um, Deaver cabin. It's back there yeah. somewhere. And before I forget it, I want to point out that when they did the National Historic Register, the cemetery is actually, there's a, a property line uh, that runs right through the middle of the cemetery. So the, each half of the cemetery is listed separately. So it's not much bigger than a postage stamp, but it's got two listings. Steve, is the cemetery you are talking about, is that the one that's up there beside the the house. Cump House, uh huh. Between it's right as you said, the line runs right across the hill. Uh, so it's between the Miller House and the Cump House. I mean, that place sold within the last couple of years. Didn't it, the house? Yeah, yeah, we've sold had within the last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tuttles uh, from Washington D.C. have it. Are they inclined to let people into the cemetery? I. 
you know, I, we've been so lucky with I've been meaning the, to call you for a year. the landowners. I don't think there would be any problem at all. Um, you go, you can go into Steve's half of the cemetery and just call the other parts on <laughs> Yeah, you own the other half. Just fall over. <laughs> Keep the cows out of the cemetery. <laughs> We have the enlistment papers uh, where someone recorded his name as William S. Cump instead of William F. Cump. If you remember, the fancy writing used to make the F a lot like an S. The, the census has M or H. 18 census has H for his mental condition. Okay. <laughs> One of those. Yeah. yeah you can pick your own, right? Yeah. Uh, William apparently was illiterate, and he only signed his name using an X, so we don't really know. Nine years after his death, the assistant uh, um, adjutant. adjutant general figured out that what William's correct name was. Okay. Is this starting, I hope you can kind of get a feel for what's where. The Ice Mountain Raven Rock we'll be talking about. Um, comp. Oh, we haven't talked about the company. Sorry. There. <laughs> in six, in six, I'm sorry. In 2016, the bridge across the North River at the west end of town was named for Private William Cump. It is the only memorial I am aware of for a Union soldier in Hampshire County. Uh -huh. We do need to give Charlie credit for for doing all of that. Indeed, is it Frederick. Is that the middle name? William Frederick, Frederick Cuff. Cuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any questions based on the map or any of the images so far? Mm -hmm. Union and Confederate forces a camp near Ice Mountain. A young Confederate home guard stood lookout on Raven Rock. He looked west and saw a cloud of dust coming from what is now Thorntown, back towards Slamesville. The young soldier took off bent down the backside of the uh, Vice Mountain, sounding the alarm. Yankees is coming! Yankees is coming! And pretty soon there was a stampede of retreating Confederates heading up Great Bridge, heading for Cape and Bridge and points east, away from the presumed bloodthirsty Union horde. Um, Major Deaver, I was told the rank was actually honorary, caught up with the retreating rebels, slapping them with the flat of his sword. He, he, um, he managed to reform the soldiers and march them back to Ice Mountain. When they inspected the invaders more closely, they were not able to discern whether the invaders' sympathies were for the north or the south. But the most important discovery was that they weren't soldiers, they were cows. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Dullier published the uh, related article in the West Virginia Advocate, maybe in the late 70s. <laughs> Any in the Fighting Guerrillas in West Virginia, the author, Captain William E. Nichols of the 153rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, wrote the Company D of that regiment, which was called out for 100 days to guard the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in West Virginia. He had previously served in the 5th Cavalry and had fought at the Battle of Shiloh. The experience of the 153rd Ohio consisted chiefly of operations against the noted Confederate uh, partisan leader, Captain John H. McNeil. On Saturday, uh, May 21st, 1864, Nichols wrote from Camp Kelly, Paul Paul Post Office. Uh, before we hear his account, let's look again. So we, we've got the Cump House, the cemetery, uh, downtown North River Mills. We talked about the Snap Mill, uh, the Cump Bridge over by Kenny Baker's, uh, Raven Rock. Yeah. I just came in from a long scouting expedition with Captain Stevens and 27 volunteers. 
We started out on the Winchester Road and searched for the bushwhackers for two days, but did not find any. At length, we went to the house of an old rebel named Johnny B. Miller at North River Mills. The house was very large one, 100 feet long and two stories high, and we searched it thoroughly without success. We ordered Miller, who was a mill owner, to a nice breakfast for two officers and 27 men. He stared a little, but we ordered him to get it quick, and he called his two daughters, his wife, his niggers, and soon we had the nicest breakfast that I have seen since I left home. Hot biscuits, good butter, homemade molasses, corn cakes, coffee, ham, eggs, cucumber pickles. We ate enough for 50 men. <laughs> so the Union um, troops have been searching for Asa Hyatt, who served in the Confederate legislature. Uh, another story describes how Union troops were on both sides of a wormwood fence firing at Asa, who surprisingly escaped unharmed. <laughs> While the mill was being pre prepared, the Union soldiers searched the house knowing that Johnny B. Miller was Secession. a They broke open the closet. The closet has never been repaired. Ted Calvitas suggested that we deserve the Procrastinator's Award. <laughs> but just in our defense, if we fix it, we don't have the key to the lock so we can't get into the cat. So that's why we haven't fixed it. Oh, you're right. Fort Thomas Parker may have been involved in a skirmish on July 3rd, 1864. It was reportedly led by General Lewis Wallace, who had his Union headquarters here, of course. Uh, many people believe he was writing his classic, Ben-Hur, while he was in Romney. Buried in the Kump Cemetery is the grave of Amos Chilka of the 13th Virginia. In a recent ceremony held honoring Amos, it was a little eerie to see reenactors of the 13th march up the dirt lane to the Chilcot grave. Dr. Gordon Sloniker uh, did his master's dis dissertation on Hampshire County in the Civil War. I'm hoping his children will allow us to post his paper online. Similarly, beating, uh, you know, kind of the bulldog, stick on, hold on to an idea. I'm hoping uh, the family of Dick Ansel will allow the publication of the um, manuscript of the Mills of Hampshire well, County. Hope. <laughs> 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 North River Mills was an industrious town. Perry Guest operated a lime kill. The structure is just past the east end of town and across from the O'Brien property near Hyatt Run, which flows under Cold Stream, on the back side of Ice Mountain as you climb Great Ridge. So, a bunch of things we've talked about back towards the center of town. This is moving towards Cape and Bridge on the back side of Ice Mountain here. Uh, perhaps not all the residents are industrious. There are numerous accounts of spirits hanging around. Um, if you check out on the porch there. <laughs> uh, hanging around Is the town. Is that a little Photoshop? <laughs> hey. We didn't do it. You just never know what you got. Uh, you snap that picture. Um, yeah. Traveling salesman. I'm sorry. Is that the house where you meet for the Ice Mountain? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, people have claimed that they've, you know, either had encounters here. We've had Ghostbusters come out three times. I'm fascinated. He claims he has a video of a little ghostly girl dancing down the hallway, but he hasn't shared it yet. Yeah. Uh, the stories of Frederick hanging around the uh, cup house sounds more convincing to me. Anyway, the salesman was called a drummer. I guess they beat on the pots, maybe. The drummer supposedly came, uh, got the expensive room upstairs rather than the cheap room's common room downstairs. Um, 
he comes downstairs with a sack over his shoulder. Uh, it's cold and wet outside, but he insists that he need to go out for a walk. He returned without the sack, and people have speculated the bag may have contained riches. Anyway, he returned, he goes upstairs and died. Uh, years later, Lake Henderson, Charlie and Wilma Miller's daughter, believed the dark stain on the floor of the drummer's room um, was a blood stain. I think it's probably water stain, but makes for a better story. She was offered that room for her own bedroom, or she, she could sleep with her grandmother who snored. She shared the room with her grandmother. Uh, the room is now referred to as the Russell Room or simply the Haunted Room. She would not go in the room? The, the door to this room was actually closed. Um, Peggy Miller told me she had never seen the inside of that door and she and uh, Sloan were married 49 years. We opened it for the first time and Stephanie being the historian that she is, left in the room just to see if she could see the ghost. <laughs> there have actually been many reports of uh, either the, we don't know because they were both blacksmiths, but people see this guy in a black leather apron and uh, burly beard uh, hanging around the Kump house. So is Frederick, one of the Frederick Kumps coming back? In 1860, the town supported a general merchandise and a grocery store. Store operators included Hyatt, Moreland, Harmison, Deaver, and Miller. In 1885, the North River store was located in what was Audrey Coaston's yard on the south side of Coldstream Road at the west end of town. It was built and operated by William Moreland. During the flood, the store was washed away. And we come back to John Guess. Uh, built the current store. I've been told it might be available for like $6,000. Uh, there's not much land with it. But there's a really cute log structure here. I would love to see somebody tear off the glass to be done away with and bring our uh, log house back, log store. Um, John Gass. John, John Gass created mm -hmm. sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. So John Gass built the current North River Mill store and was its first owner. Another early owner was Love Wolf, who owned the store in the 1920s. Rum Martin ran the store for only about a month. Chris Harmison ran the store and lived in the store later. In 1950, Lee Deaver, World War I veteran, owned the store. He then sold it to Bruce Miller and moved to Paw Paw. Later, Lee moved back and bought the store back. When Lee Deaver died in 1952, Bruce Miller again bought the store. Yeah. You get that? Yeah. Uh, one of the workers in the store, when it was owned by John Guest, was Wade Pugh. Yeah, he was so admired by Alma Guest, John's wife, that she named her son Wade Good Guest after him. Good Guest can remember being set up on the high counter of the store and given animal crackers out of a large box since he didn't like candy. Um, store also sold and dressed turkeys, which were put in large barrels, held 367 pounds of food. To help sell items, John Guest would take a wagon of goods uh, to Riggs Hollow. That's there's the North River Valley uh, comes out at the Liberty Station. This would be one valley to the east. Thank you. Um, sometimes people would barter for goods. Then he would make a circle coming back by North River Valley. The store was always the center of town, and it was more than just a grocery store. It served as a chamber of commerce, an information center, a local gathering spot, and a delivery drop-off, among other things. The North River Mills Post Office was in the store twice. The postmistress were Alma Guest and Betty Miller. In 1960, Betty and 
Bruce and Betty Miller held turkey shoots from the back of the store. One time, Lynn, my sister, uh, Bales Hall sitting back here, was flying in from across the country and her luggage was lost. The airline policy said they were to deliver her luggage to the place she was visiting. Uh, Lynn said that they could, could leave the luggage at the store. The man who was delivering the luggage probably had not been out of the D.C. area and had many questions such as, what are the store hours? How will the owner contact you? What should I do if the store is closed? Lynn left the man speechless when she answered, don't worry, they, they'll be there because they live in the store. The store also served as a local cooking store. When I was a newlywed, I would go to the store to buy some last minute item for dinner. The store would be filled with this wonderful smell of whatever the Millers were having for dinner. And they often didn't have what I wanted to fix for dinner. So Betty would tell me what she was fixing. She would take me around the store and help me buy everything that I needed. She'd give me the recipes and any other details I needed. The store uh, looked a lot like a, um, a museum. Uh, stuffed animals up on the wall and uh, quite a collection of rifles, uh, antique rifles. The North River Mills Church was not the first Methodist church in the area. Uh, William Miller, shown here, uh, actually gave the property because he didn't think people, his family should have to drive, what, two miles uh, to go to church up on top of Great Bridge. Um, the, he thought the um, needed church that was closer. Eight, so in 1896, uh, the North River Mills Methodist Episcopal Church was built. There's a balcony that was used by the blacks. Um, although there may have only been one Negro family in the church, uh, the Methodist Church thought they were very progressive. It was one of the first churches to allow blacks and whites to worship together. The ceiling is stenciled with a black paint and on top of the walls are stenciled in red. The pattern is considered simple. It was felt that the congregation did the work themselves. Pastor Debbie McCallan invited an expert on his historic art to look at our stenciling. The expert said the stenciling may have been made from the thumbprints of all of the parishioners. There's a lantern light in the center of the church <laughs> and it was used full time until electric was added to the church in 1981 by Reverend Nelson. Church used to have church picnics during the summer. Some of the men would go up to Ice Mountain and get enough ice to make ice cream and lemonade. Lake Henderson remembered doing this as a small child. Church has always had honeybees in the walls. While Reverend Grosskopf was serving the church back 1920-1924, he would take, you can see where the uh, boards were cut, and he'd take the siding off, take the honey out, replace the siding. Um, Sorry. You still take the honey out? I've taken many hives out. I've never taken the honey. Uh, I bet I got four hives out of that church. In my all I, I had what? Certainly a couple dozen hives that all died where I was tending them, but the hives in the uh, church have existed apparently since the church was built. You might have called that holy honey. Holy honey. <laughs> uh, there's a great story, I'm getting off topic, sorry. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Prodigal Summer. Uh, I can't call the author. King Solver. Thank Solver. you. Barbara King Solver. And uh, they get the bright idea they're going to kill the bees. And, um, but without the bees to fan the honey in the heat of the summer, all that wax melts <laughs> and made worse mess than they. So we're not messing. Bees don't bother us. It's kind of fun to watch them there. <laughs> Stacy 
Um, Reverend Grosskopf's son mm -hmm. was born in the old Caton Bridge Parsonage. What do we have there? There he is. Uh, Stacy also became a pastor and was Terry's uh, pastor in Morgantown. He was well known in the archery world. He was featured. He actually came to Romney to give some exhibitions. Uh, we, <laughs> he has me take a baby aspen. Terry told me this when we were dating, and I thought she was pulling my leg, but I, I saw it. Uh, you throw the baby aspirin up in the air with bow and arrow, he hits it, and you say, well, you know, how do you know whether he hit it? Because, you know, most people wouldn't be able to see it. But he would use a blunt tip arrow, and when it hit the aspirin, you'd see this poof of uh, dust. And he could do it time after time. Just amazing. Um, so, back to, uh, how about the one-room schoolhouse? Okay. Uh, one room schoolhouse is located beyond the church where the children from grades 1 to 8 attended. It was the second school for North River Mills. The first one was located just behind where the <coughs> one room school is today. The second school came from Shiloh when Shiloh got their big two room school. Uh, the map. map shows the location of the schoolhouse. Um, some of the other things we've talked about. So there's the church, the center of town, and it's just right behind the church. Lake Miller Henderson attended North River Mill School until high school. The high school was located in Caton Bridge uh, back in that day, eight miles was a long ride. And uh, so rather than try to commute the whole eight miles, she actually stayed with a family in Cape Bridge. Um, at that time, so Lake Sloan, Lake's brother, uh, only attended North River Mills for one year. Then they had buses and he could ride up Slainsville. Slainsville had a two-room schoolhouse. The North River Mill School had an interesting tradition. On the first day of school, the older boys would build a teepee. When I asked how this was started, no one knew for sure. The back wall of the school has writing where the students would sign their name. Some of the teachers there were Maude Pugh, Arthur Sloniker, Ebby Slaville, and Love Wolf. Have you all heard of Chris Tinkling? I think it's also called mummering, uh, Christmas tradition. It's some uh, maybe a mixture between uh, Christmas caroling and trick or treating. Uh, Christmas time, youths would go house to house. They disguise themselves and sing the the Christmas carols. They try not to let anyone know who they were. The youth of the church would go, uh, yeah, to, from house to house. John Whitaker said he bought a pair of new boots, three or four times actual foot size, just so nobody would recognize them. He, he hid them in the barn um, so people wouldn't find out. He had a sheet over them that, that was part of his costume, and someone was chasing him trying to figure out who he was, and he punched him uh, to avoid being identified. The North River Mill School closed in... 1933, and it was turned into a garage. The sign on the front still remains today. Gene Williams shared a photo of his grandfather, Samuel Holland Williams, S.H. Williams, uh, called Hall, was born in 1840. Hall's father was George Scharf Williams, and his mother was Mary Mendenhall Williams. Hall's home place was at what is now the Baker Farm. Um, the old cemetery is on the ridge. You can see North River uh, in the background. Uh, the old Steph's actually standing in the cemetery. Yeah. Here. Uh, it's on the ridge. The old house um, back towards Coldstream Road burned down long ago. But... Um, he was a private in Company K, 18th Virginia Cavalry. He married 
Harriet Ella Taylor of Mechanicsburg, west of Romney. They'll, their children were Nell, Marvin, George, Phil, Dan, Paul, which was Jean's father, born in 1894. Um, Jean, John, and Louise. The Smokes <coughs> family was German, and they lived about a mile and a quarter from the Cump House. William and Caroline Smoltz had five children. After some of the William's children died, he tried to commit suicide, and he ran up to the top of Raven Rock and was going to jump off. Luckily, the sheriff, William Miller, talked him down. Location of the Smoltz. And I, I had a typo there. I wrote that it was William's children. It's the Smoltz children. And so the old man, I think that's during the, what they call the Spanish flu, was one of the deaths made at North River Mills. And um, the old man couldn't take the grief, so he's up on the rocks, apparently yelling in German that he was going back to the homeland. And uh, Mr. Miller managed to calm him down, get him back. So we have uh, the center of town here. Uh, if you take the dirt road directly across from the end, uh, you can come back to the Smoltz Park. Henry and Ella Smoltz were two of the Smoltz children that survived. The story goes that when Henry died, Ella never touched anything in his room so you could see the impression of his body on the feather tick. Ella had about 25 mangy cats and... One blind chicken. <laughs> one time. <laughs> the cats would get up on the table. Wilma Miller used to tell how she hated going to their house deep because the cats would eat off the plates. Smaltz Family Cemetery is located on the hill near the house. HistoricHampshire.org hosts a list of all the local cemeteries, including the Mendel Hall, Williams, Comp, Smoltz, Loy, Hyatt, and... Yeah, Silcott. Hey, some of the old-timers, I would call it Chilcott, but I've heard it pronounced Silcott, Short, and Wills. The Macaulay Farm is about a mile and a half southwest of the center of North River Mills. The house was probably built in 1918. Charlie McCauley first lived in a smaller structure. When Charlie McCauley got the land, the only cleared spot was the garden. This is where he built the house. The McCauleys cleared many fields. Charlie McCauley's first barn burnt down. Charlie Harmison told of the thunderstorm and how lightning struck the barn. The, um, both Charlie and Lenny were away from home at the time. Someone saw the fire and told Charlie Harmison. Charlie Harmison ran across a few fields in North River, but by the time they got to the barn, there wasn't um, anything they could do. Along with many farm tools, two large workhorses were lost in the fire. But the whole community got together to have a barn raising. They uh, they rebuilt the barn in two days with the wood supplied by Charlie Harmison. Wow. Next to the house is an ice house, which I have real personal feelings about. It's 16 by 10, and we lived in it for 18 months. <laughs> and I would move back to it, but I can't talk around. <laughs> no, really. Were you newlyweds then? Yes, we were. <laughs> That explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> the walls are eight inches thick and they're filled with sawdust, which acts as insulation. The Macaulays would put would go down to the North River when it was frozen, <laughs> cut large chunks of ice, and then put the ice in the ice house where it would keep through the summer. Lenny, Charlie's wife, liked to eat squirrel. This is uh, what his her. Uh, son Rodney told us. Uh, when she got hungry for it, she'd go out and shoot two or three herself. Uh, 
She'd clean them, cook them herself. That's Rodney holding his mom's shooting arm. <laughs> we have Audrey Hawkins Croston's journal from 1935 and 36. I doubted that she read realized she was recording history, but she left a fascinating account of the floods, the dust ball, the clouds that were blotted out, sun for days, a fire that threatened to destroy the town had they not worked together to build backfires, worship services in the homes, neighbors helping neighbors, building barns, gathering crops. Take a hike now. Uh, you, you're out for a walk on a day that is 90 degrees and you feel cold air coming out of holes in the ground. When you look closer you notice ice. Maybe the sun's starting to affect you or maybe you're at Ice Mountain. Uh, also called nature's ice box. Ice Mountain with an elevation of 700 feet above sea level is a hanging rock formation that collapsed and formed the slope, the Ariscany sandstone, which trapped cold, which traps the cold. This algebraic tailless slope recharges itself every winter, trapping ice, snow, and cold air. The rocks provide shade against the sun. Uh, the, I'm going to go back there just for a minute. Uh, you can see this from so many places, Route 29 out around Slanesville, uh, from Dale's house, I think you're looking at Raven Rock. Um, and then the town itself is right down here in the gap. Mm -hmm. The environment has combined Appalachian, uh, Canadian, and Arctic species, and that combination is very rare. Many botanists have studied the arboreal plants growing on Ice Mountain, including the bunchberry, uh, the twin flower, uh, Linnaeus borealis. Uh, remember Carlos Linnaeus from your high school biology class? Um, dwarf bristly, well, bristly rose, northern bed straw. Um, these plants are common in Canada and Arctic regions, but rare in West Virginia. The mountain also has tremendous white pines, yellow birches that grow from the rocky slopes. In the moister areas, there are hemlocks and hardwoods such as walnuts, oaks, maples, cucumber trees. Uh, the West Virginia state flower, the rhododendron, grows in thick clusters along the mountainside. Blooms each year around the state's birthday, June 20th. Ice Mountain is also noted for its birds and other wildlife. Over 80 species of winter and summer birds have been spotted on Ice Mountain on recent bird counts. Um, there is bird bird outing tomorrow morning at the Indian Mound Cemetery at 9 o'clock, if anybody's interested. And then we'll try to get you to come out to Ice Mountain and tell us what birds we have. Nesting warblers, which migrate to the Latin American rainforest um, in the fall, have been found on Ice Mountain in the spring. But no spreading chestnut tree. No spreading <laughs> chestnut tree. <laughs> if you hike up the path, you would come to the summit called Raven Rock. Um, it is named from the raven that nests on top of the 200 foot high cliff. Ben Wills was uh, one of the people who lived on Ice Mountain. In winter, he would cut ice off North River. Though he wanted to be buried at three churches, he's buried in our cemetery, the, or the Kump Cemetery. Uh, there was, it might have been the 1935-36 flood, and they, nobody could get him out of town. So they stuck him in the closest cemetery. The Some of the generations of Deavers owned Ice Mountain. Lamar Pugh's mother was a Deaver. He lived in the 1800 log cabin until he died in 1962. He would collect a small fee to go across the bridge. And I always heard that he charged you a nickel to go across and a dime to come back. <laughs> but that's 
we don't have proof. Uh, he maintained a pavilion with picnic tables, and there's a photo of Steve and Wendell Moreland's forebear on Ice Mountain. And Steve, can you tell us any more about him? Uh, well, you gave I'm, me the names. I always thought, and frankly, I didn't find it until after my grandmother passed away. Yeah. I thought it sort of looked like an engagement picture. Yeah. I think it. I think it had a date on the original, like 1920 or 21, which would have made my grandfather about 21 and my grandmother about 16. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too that you can't see it on that, but I mean, she was. They were very poor uh, people. She was a, uh, her mother was Charlie Love Miller's sister. Um, and then she married Kidwell, so my, my grandmother's maiden name was Kidwell, but they were very poor folks. But she has a wrist watch on her wrist, which I think is. That's cool. But um, I never saw my grandfather wear a tie in his life. Yeah. <laughs> Except in that That's cool. Gordy Fultz's uh, home was a half mile, that's not his home, that was an outbuilding, sorry, uh, a half mile as crow flies from the town. Folks who frequented Mountaintop Restaurant uh, might remember his daughter, Edda O'Neill Fultz Kimball. Edda sat down with National Teacher of the Year, Ray Ellen. Scanlon McKee, and Charlie did an interview. Um, her grandmother, Sally Kidwell, uh, ran the poor farm at the Glee. And the Nipplings now own the land. Maybe you know Rachel Carson's environmental classic, Silent Spring. Uh, flick, flip back to the index and you'll find Carson featured uh, Dr. E.F. Nippling for his pioneering work controlling insects with DDT. Uh, <laughs> Nippling family now owns the uh, Gordy Fultz place. Even though North River Mills has almost died away, the story told by its residents keep it alive in our hearts and minds. The tale, tale of diverse communities that can almost be mistaken for one large family. Many people in the area have worked hard to preserve what is left of North River Mills. The town's heritage is celebrated every year on North River Mills Day, which is the Saturday before Mother's Day. That's uh, Lynn, we just got this one, I think. Um, Lenny McCauley's Go to Town buggy. Uh, there's Charlie Miller and Charlie's behind his house heading up Ice Mountain. Uh, when I was a kid, you'd see the sheep uh, grazing. Uh, this was in the old schoolhouse. Uh, John Moreland. Uh, what's the significance, Lynn? Can you tell me? I don't remember the year. And I didn't write it down. I can't tell. Yeah, I can't read it. Um, but thank you for it. Um, so there's the old store. When did the old store quit doing business? I thought I was in there when I was in my 20s and the early 70s. 70s. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think Stephanie. Would have gone they, in. She's born in 80. Yeah. And they were old enough, the girls were old enough that we could let them walk down to the store and buy ice cream. Yeah. So maybe so, early 80s? Yeah. Did Bruce have like, any Bruce uh, yeah. Yes, but Wilma survived yeah. him. Yeah. Betty. Yeah. And then their Come daughter. Back. Come back. Their daughter took it over from there and had it open for a little while. The Deaver place? There's, you're asking what? That's right. Uh, where, where, where was that? Deaver Road, D-E-V-E-R. Uh, go back by Broad... Brookfield. Brookfield. Uh, Kenny Baker has a barn there. Yeah. So it's on the back side of, uh, the Cape and Bridge side of Great Bridge. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Wilma Miller's family, the McDonald's, uh, Steph and Susan. Now, they, I've only got a few photos left, but I have no idea what they are. Um, this was in Lake Henderson's collection. Uh, one, we were told that it was mortician, but then somebody else involved in crime investigation says, no, no, that's a, uh, you know, a crime scene investigation. Uh, so if anybody wants to try it, or if you recognize any of the people, I'd love to know who these people are. <laughs> what was that, Steve? Uh, apples. Oh, apples. Oh. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to put an apple on the head and do <laughs> William <laughs> Tell. <laughs> I think that's it. You all have been wonderful, very you patient. Don't, you don't have a picture of the Hyatt hats. No. Well, North River Mills has two very interesting houses. One of them is the Miller house, and the other is the Hyatt house. A lot of houses in uh, Hampshire County are Snap. basically log cabins. And often what people did when they enlarged them was to put two log cabins together. So you could either take two log cabins and put them together. You have one wall, two walls, and one wall. <coughs> But in North River Mills, in the Miller House, they took the two cabins and they put them back, what, 12 feet apart or so, and they made a joint, a, a hallway between the two. But in the Hyatt House, it's the only house that I have met in right there, the only one I've ever seen, that they took both end walls off the cabins and put them together. And now that house has stood all these years and snow comes down and everything. No, that's in North River Mills. North River Mills. That's it. Slainsville into town. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn, what, your dad lived here? No, my dad lived, um, he lived with his grandpa. Okay. He lived with his grandfather, John W. Guess. Right. And they lived, they were across the river from where you live. Right. I think the bridge washed away, but I think the way you get to it now is you go to the boy. Um, Calm down. Yeah. yeah. I and, wanted to see that. I wanted to take, you know, um, Sam Smith, you know, Cooper right. Martin, William Smith. Yeah. See, his mother and my grandmother were sisters. Yeah. They were two Dutchman's daughters. Yeah. And I told him, I said, well, come get you one day, and I want you to take him back there and show me where my dad lived when he was cool. a kid. And Carolyn Grapes, didn't your dad live in? You no, know, my mother and daddy lived in that long house as you're going out of Towards Slainsville. Yeah. yeah, that may not be a good picture, but that's it. They lived on the far side when I was born. Yeah, I'll be. And Daddy drove the And Maud Pugh. Bus. They closed uh, North River Mill School then. And Daddy drove the <coughs> bus. And there were two little girls. He thought they were so precious. When I was born, he gave me their names. Thank you, Lord. I could have been named Anastasia Drisola. <laughs> <laughs> I got those two old sisters' names. He got $35 a month. I mean, that was 1935, 1936. He thought he was a man. Because he worked all day for $1 for anybody who had any work. Yeah. And they closed the school. Most of them else, and they wanted to bus drive and go to the kids. Take kids from here. Okay. You know, $25 a month. Steve? Yeah. I'm told by my oh, dad. Good story. Yeah. I'm told by my dad that my great uncle, who was Billy Kidwell, he was right. the assessor here in Hampshire County in like the early 70s, owned that house during the Depression and lost it to a foreclosure for $300. Because he couldn't make it. And of course, who knows what the payments were? Probably yeah. dollars a month. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Can you go back to the one with Susan? Which one? Susan I bet Charlie's uh, website, no, Historic no, Hampshire, no. begins, I think, with the uh, Maud Pugh prologue where they're walking through town. She starts out, she was living in. She was living in the Snap House, wasn't she? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so I'm going back to what? Susan. Oh, Susan and Steph? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. I thought you could 
It's like three or four slides yeah. up. I just couldn't. This one. Yeah. Two monitors. <laughs> uh, Stephanie and Susan were in my Girl Scout troop, and Steph's Girl Scout project involved North River Mills, of course, because that's what she loves. Susan caught the bug and went to the church. The 1890 Bible was in really bad repair, and you can see that Bible in, in the, the picture. Back corner. Yeah, well, I'm getting that, one, but I mean, oh, in the picture that uh, Mr. Dulier took, and you can see how bad it looks. The church people trusted me, thank goodness, and let me send it home with Susan. And for her gold project, she restored that Bible. The Bible is in the back corner, and you can see the work that she did. And uh, you might not know the McBride name, but her grandparents were the Smiths of the bookbinding Smiths. Uh, Susan also made a present for Steve and I, and it's uh, one of the three books back there with the Ice Mountain, Hood Toward Ice Mountain. Um, I just wanted to point that out, that as a, she was probably 17 at the time. Uh, as long as you have her up there, I have to point out, people had asked me how I ever got involved in Hampshire County history. I told her it was a beautiful woman, fell in love with her, got me involved. <laughs> when Steph was about 12, it was one of her summer projects, she was going to give tours at North River Mills. And I said, Steph, you can't give tours unless you have a brochure to hand out. So, I don't know where the file is. Where did it's, it's, it's over by your... Yes. It's over in the corner. Yes. But this That's is what I wrote for her. This is a later edition, but basically that was the thing that got me into the history of, of Hampshire County because I discovered that the property I live on had been granted to Dr. James Craig. It was the old Gibbons property that was already been carried off the pension of the That's what got me into realizing how this story of Hampshire County. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not Charlie Hook. <laughs> Again, thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Hope you well come the day before Mother's Day, North River Mills. The weekend before or the day before? The day before. The day before. May 11th. Marvelous.